My name is Laura Rykovich. I'm the director of the Queen's Museum. And uh, John and I have just been talking and will continue to do so. But um, I'm sure you all know John Rubin. Uh, he is an incredible artist who has worked on many, many extraordinary projects, many of which he'll tell you about. So I'm not going to waste time list listing all of them. And you have his bio also on the open engagement uh, materials. But, um, but just to say, John has been running conference Conflict Kitchen with Don Waleski for quite some time now. Uh, too much praise and adulation for many of us. And um, I'm thrilled to be with him here today to talk to you guys a little bit about a variety of different issues that I think are embedded in his work and also in mine, um, you know, as, as a, as a uh, cultural producer. So we just, we decided we would dive into some of John's projects and have him talk about them more broadly. Um, highlighting some other projects outside of Conflict Kitchen, and then John and I will have sort of a free-flowing exchange about some of the major issues that this brings up, and then we'll open up to some Q&A. So, um, John, why don't you take it away? Cool. Hi. Uh, welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, I'm going to um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects that are kind of specific to how I deal with kind of various political contexts and situations both locally and internationally and how sometimes those are uh, the attempts I make to collide those two. Um, and then we'll just sort of move forward. Uh, and I'm actually going to start with something I haven't shown in a long time, but I, I'm going to start with a series of projects that um, are related to Iran. And I've never been to Iran. I'm actually going for the first time uh, next month. And, um, but I, I made several close friends with Iranian artists who, um, through various projects that I, would do, I was doing. And, um, and so one of the first, uh, this is maybe the second project I did was this. This is with uh, Andrea Grover, who's a curator at the Parish Museum. Um, it's called Never Been to Tehran. And, the way in which it works is we were in conversation with lots of artists who were living in Tehran and talking about the political conditions at the time. And this was you know, eight years ago when things didn't feel very different than they do today. Um, and, and I recognized like, you know, the fact that, that just this incapacity to truly understand a place you've never been to. And obviously, you know, the way in which you hear about it in many ways is kind of, uh, you know, is a lens that's often cloudy. And, um, and how do you deal with that as, a, as an American, specifically, right? And obviously the conflict kitchen is one manifestation of how we can deal with that in a public space, but I was trying to find another way. This is way before that project started. So what I did is Andrea and I invited an international um, array of artists and photographers um, to participate in this project. And during the, the two months of the project, if you were a participant um, in whatever city you were living in, here in London, um, Levin would have to take a photograph every day of what he imagined Tehran to look like in his own hometown. So to project, to, to have an almost like absurd, empathic response um, and a distorted mirror, obviously, right? Because you're representing a place you've never been to. You're, you're in some ways maybe mirroring sort of the distortion that happens in the media or these biases or prejudices that you might hold. But maybe even beyond that, and maybe confessing to that is a really powerful thing, and still trying to move forward and, and recognize that place within the world you, you live in yourself. Um, and this is Otto. So these are photos that, for whatever reason, we didn't tell anyone what they should take photos of. They felt, you know, felt like Tehran to them. And uh, they were uploaded to just a database and then exhibited in the parking gallery um, in Tehran, was the main exhibition site. So folks in Tehran got this incredibly, you know, it's like a, a tour of the world, um, as they imagined Tehran to look. Um, and it's completely off, and maybe there's something that hits, and there's like, you know, to me, I'm fascinated with that space between, you know, what you know and what you don't, who you are and who you aren't, and how you can, it's a very fictional, constructed uh, 
zone. And so we also had it at, at uh, five other exhibition sites. So it's a pretty easy project to exhibit because it was just online. Um, and all you had to do is you know, hook up a projector and you can have the exhibition. So in Pittsburgh, in Italy. This is Zoe Strauss, an amazing photographer in, in Philadelphia. Uh, Lee Walton, an amazing artist in Greensboro. Um, and then it was projected, this is in the parking um, gallery in Tehran, and this is in Copenhagen, and this is in Chicago, and this is here in Pittsburgh downtown, we had a little, uh, you know, Pittsburgh, you can get spaces in Pittsburgh, you can convince people to do stuff for you. Um, so this is a, a video board that we had for the course of the exhibition. So, even today, if you're just across the street where Conflict Kitchen um, is located, we're, we're running um, something that we run on an ongoing basis, we call it The Foreigner. And it kind of somewhat similar premise, but you know, this project started before I even opened Conflict Kitchen, but I'm gonna kind of show the Conflict Kitchen version of it. And right now, um, we're working with someone in Palestine, but uh, when we first opened the Conflict Kitchen, we opened an Iranian version. And the way it works is if you come to eat, and if I don't know if anyone who came today, they were probably you know, assaulted by someone asking them if they want to have lunch, in this case with Sorab, my friend who lives in Iran, through the body of Elise, who is a local here in Pittsburgh. And uh, you go around the corner, and Elise has headphones on, and she's live connected to Sorab. Sorab speaks English, so she doesn't have to do translation. And she repeats anything Sorab says. She becomes a kind of human avatar. And then the customer has a little mic, and you talk to Elise. Did, did anyone get to do this today? He did, in the back, yeah. Um, and I'm gonna play a little video. So in many ways, this, this kind of small little project is a metaphor we always think for the larger project of Conflict Kitchen, right? Is this connect and disconnect. The, the attempt at a simultaneity of culture and space and a closure of distance between self and other, um, and the impossibility of the same, you know, recognizing the, the fiction of the space in between. Um, and even, you know, I'm interested in the fact that, you know, a woman is representing a man, um, that gender, age, um, race often gets kind of confused, in a, and I think, some, you know, in a very effective way. So I, I developed this with Felipe Casablanco, who was actually a graduate student here at CCA. No, CCA, that's the school I used to teach at. <laughs> now I teach at CMU. <laughs> I should remember that. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, so we, we first developed it at a, a place called Spaces in Cleveland. Um, they have a research and development kind of lab, and we did it in various public spaces throughout Cleveland where we have these avatars on the left, uh, yeah, and the, uh, the Iranians on the right that they were representing. It was very difficult, I have to say it wasn't quite a success. Because if, you know, you just walk up to someone in a library and you say, hi, I'm from Iran. Yeah, it doesn't, there's no context. It's very difficult to get someone into a kind of complicated scenario that's happening. And so uh, the next time we tried it, we were invited to the San Diego Museum of Art. And this time there was a bit of context. You, when you came in, you were given this handout. And then in the Persian gallery, um, you met Sarab. And Sarab was in his contemporary art space in Iran. So here you are with you know, these Persian miniatures and sort of historical space that you know, has a certain romantic notion of, of what, you know, Iranian history is like, and then he, uh, Sorab is talking to you about the issues he deals with day to day in his space. Um, so I'm going to see, maybe I'll just. Tell us whether they're right now. Hi, I'm going to say hey. Are you, so you're in Iraq right now. Okay. Have you been to the United States before? Yeah. This is a new review of the New York Freedom in Iran. What do you guys think of America or Americans? Like, how do we come across? Okay, so a project Don Molesky and I did in, in Brazil, this is for the Mercosul Biennial, and here now the context is the politics of, um, uh, politics of Brazil, but also I think a, a very American concern as well. Um, 
you would, I'll just sort of play out how the project works. It's in this main um, town, in the, I mean, so the main square in this lake. And it's, it's kind of like the plaza out here in some ways. It's a place people come to hang out. Um, there's signs saying that there's, there's uh, speeches by Hugo Chavez and Barack Obama. So Hugo Chavez was still alive. Um, and then people would line up. This, would all, this was already occurring. People would line up to take these swan boat rides, you know, to take these romantic rides out onto the lake. We changed the sign so that on the weekends um, you could take a free ride gratis with uh, Chavez or Obama. <laughs> and then we had uh, Barack Obama <laughs> and Chavez waiting for you. And what we were interested in is, you know, Brazil is really, you know, especially at the time, you know, stuck between a you know, very progressive socialist agenda, especially in Puerto Alegre, um, and completely in bed with the IMF. and. Um, you know, in the United States, and this, you know, where are they going to sit? And these presidents are the ones you can, you know, the most sort of performative, I think, in, in global politics at the time. People irrationally loved or hated both of them. Um, and so what would happen is during your ride, um, they would ask you the question a lover asks is, you know, what do you think of me? Um, do you like me? Don't you like me? Why? And then, with a tape recorder, the public would tell their opinions. And in the evenings, much like the Obama speech that I showed to begin with, they would get out on these platforms that floated, and they would give the verbatim speech of the Brazilian public's opinions of them. They'd turn it into first person. And as the weeks went on, the speeches got longer. And, and then, you know, you could see Obama and Chavez in relationship to each other. There were speakers throughout the plaza, so when you approach, you hear the speeches kind of colliding with each other. Um, or you could ride your boat up and listen to them, or sit on the side, it's very romantic. It's good to be able to make romantic art. Um, but also very political, I mean, you know, people were saying really sometimes outrageous things. That, you know, using humor, romance, you know, allows an entry point to these things that maybe people wouldn't want to come in contact with, these ideas, rather. Um, so... So just very briefly, you know, I have run a couple of projects here in Pittsburgh. You know, it's a very different experience. I, I love working in the city I live in. Um, it's a cheap town to do such. I mean, I rent spaces for just about, for 500 bucks a month. I can get a storefront like this one and run a waffle shop that has a talk show in it that the customers are the guests on the talk show. Um, we ran this for four years. And... You know, it's, it's, it's an incredibly supportive city, and it's a place where I can kind of be in a call and response relationship to the community that I'm uh, living within. I can live a mile from a place and go to it every day and see how it's working and not and change it. Um, and that's a very different experience than projects happen in places I do not live, and I recognize the, you know, the capacities you have to make work at home. I really believe that it's important to make work at home. Um, and create culture for the community that you know you reside in on a daily basis, and it's it's kind of the other stuff is candy, and this is the protein for me. Um, this is a great talk show where all of her alter egos interview any customer who comes in. Gap Vanessa, she's a great comedian here in Pittsburgh. So anyway, this went on for quite some time. A beautiful project, I think. Tens of thousands of people came. Um, I also continue to run a billboard called The Last Billboard, which brings in artists from all over the world um, to exhibit on this, on top of a building in Pittsburgh. This is Nina Kachadorian, Mark Horowitz, an 11-year-old girl, um, Adam Fraylin. Um, so I'm going to just quickly, I'm just going to quickly talk about Conflict Kitchen, but um, I want to get to, oops, yeah. Um, Okay, and uh, I'm not going to show the video. So after running the waffle shop for about four years and getting bored and then starting the billboard and then getting bored again, and Don Molesky was working for me at the time at the <coughs> waffle shop, we started talking about what we could do that would just sort of yet another thing. And, um, and the Conflict Kitchen developed really out of this idea of the, how the talk show functioned in public space, how we could bring in like strangers via this talk show to communicate with each other. Um, it was an incredible mechanism, and the food was a, like we were making money. 
who fucking makes money in the art world doing the shit we do, or I do, or many of you do, right? It's really hard to make money in this stuff. Outside of grants and begging. I spend, right? I'm so sick of fucking begging. Um, and so, like, well, this was making money. And the culture was amazing, and, we, and people were producing, and it was, like, completely stream of consciousness, and weird, and it fit all my desires. Um, but we decided we, there was also a possibility here to do something a little more focused. Um, specifically for Pittsburgh, um, a place that's never had a Persian restaurant, or an Afghan restaurant, or a Palestinian restaurant, um, or a Cuban restaurant. Um, and that, that, you know, can we make Pittsburgh the place we want it to be? Can we have the political discussions, the global politics actually be relevant to the provincial place of a city that's small and post-industrial? It is to many people. Why can't it be in the public sphere? 